We turn now to the New Testament letter of Galatians. We're right at the end of the letter, the last chapter, and uh, Paul is writing, giving some very specific instructions for what it means to live in community together. And so he says things like, bear one another's burdens and work for good for all people. Hear these words. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work, then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we're just back from a, a little vacation. We were able to, to go on a trip to Florida, my wife Joy and I, and uh, our oldest daughter, uh, or I'm sorry, our youngest daughter Mara, and our middle daughter Annie actually joined us for a, a portion of that as well. But uh, we got down there and Mara got sick. She got COVID. And, um, you know, when you, when you get COVID, now the protocol is you need to quarantine, you need to isolate for five days, and you continue to mask for another five days, you know, a 10-day total kind of a thing. Um, thankfully, we had a two-bedroom uh, rental, and so uh, Mara was able to quarantine and be isolated in that one bedroom. But I was thinking, boy, how sad is that? Here we are on vacation, we're in Florida, we're just next to the ocean. It's about a two minute walk, right, to go over to the ocean. And, and here she is, she's got COVID and she's sick. And then I got COVID. <laughs> I tested positive for COVID. And, and I was thinking, Oh man, how sad is this, right? You know, but the good news is we had that sort of isolation, quarantine, second bedroom. Thankfully, it had two twin beds. So she's in one bed and I'm in the other. We're quarantined in there. And um, it was kind of a, a sad thing to have to, to be sick and, and on vacation. Um, the good news was, you know, we were really close. We could just walk right over to the beach and we could kind of keep away from, from all the people. I just had to shout, you know, unclean, unclean to, you know, make anyone's get close, make sure they stay away. Uh, but you know, when you're sick, and especially when you're quarantining, isolating, you really need to have someone take care of you. And my wife, Joy, she did that for us. So she would make all the food. She had to make the food for us, and then she'd bring it to the bedroom uh, door and leave it on the floor and run away quickly, right? And uh, I know she kind of got a little bit tired of having to do all of the running around and fixing the food for, for us while we were just in that isolation room. And, and yet it was a real blessing to have someone to, to care for us in that way. And it kind of reminded me of another vacation. A few years ago, uh, Joy and I, and, and again, two of our daughters, our, our daughter, uh, Mara, who leads worship here, and our, our middle daughter, uh, Anne, uh, we took a, a trip to California and we drove part of that Pacific Coast Highway uh, from Southern California, you know, from, from Los Angeles up to San Francisco. So when we flew into Los Angeles, we got a rental uh, vehicle and it was a minivan and we thought that would be really nice. It was big. It was, you know, had a lot of space. We could throw our stuff in the back and we could stretch out and good windows to look and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and so we thought that would be a, a good vehicle for taking in the coastline and all the scenery. And um, we stayed in Malibu a couple of nights. There was a, a little rental right on the, the beach when the tide came in. It literally came crashing under the house. It was kind of a, a, an eerie thing, but kind of a cool thing. And we walked on the beach and we saw dolphins. And, and then we drove on up the coastline, right? We were stopping here and there as we were driving that Pacific Coast Highway until we got to Pismo Beach. And then we stayed a, a couple more nights at this hotel that was just perched right up on the rocks on this sort of cliff overlooking the, the Pacific Ocean. And again, we walked on the beach and we explored the, the caves that were there and enjoyed this beauty. And 
We drove further north uh, on the Pacific Coast Highway through Big Sur, that sort of well-known area. We stopped at several places. We saw elephant seals and, and a beach with purple sand and waves pounding on the rocks and a beautiful waterfall, the, the famous Bixby Bridge. But after a couple more nights, we drove that last leg of the journey uh, to San Francisco. On the way, we stopped at this sort of uh, fruit stand alongside the road, got some wonderful fresh produce uh, there, and um, we thought we'd uh, see a little bit after we got to San Francisco. We thought we'd see a little bit before we drove uh, to the place where we were staying, which was actually on the north side uh, over the, the Golden Gate Bridge. And so we, we found our way to uh, what's called the Palace of Fine Arts. It's sort of this beautiful monumental uh, structure uh, that was originally constructed back in 1915 for the Panama Pacific Exposition. And it was constructed so that works of art could be presented there. And it's really kind of this beautiful place and there's some water and, and uh, there's a grassy area around it. And people would just kind of lay in the grass. And, and it was just this beautiful time, right? It was beautiful, it was a lovely sunny day. We walked around, looked at it, but then we laid on the grass just like the locals, right? And, um, and then we walked a, a couple of blocks back to uh, where the rental van was parked. And as we got close, all of a sudden Mara said, why is the back end open? We rushed up to the van and we saw uh, the back end wasn't open, but the, but the, rear, uh, the rear window had been smashed uh, completely. And, and we were sort of shocked and panicked uh, about this. And, and I opened up the rear hatch of the, the van and, and we looked, I mean, our like our stuff was there, our suitcases was there, the, the fruit that we had just gotten from that fruit stand, it, it was still there. And then suddenly uh, my wife, Joy said, my, my backpack's gone. And, and then I realized that mine was gone as well. M Mara in that moment just panicked and she ran around to the side door to her seat where she'd been sitting and and she saw that her backpack was gone as well and and she just sort of crumpled in a heap to the ground right there because her songwriting journal was in in there and it was irreplaceable and and then Annie, our daughter, she saw that her backpack was gone. And not only that, her purse was gone because she'd left her purse with her wallet in the vehicle. She'd taken her big camera so that she could take some lovely photos. And we were just, you know, sort of in shock standing there in the street. Uh, now, this is a neighborhood where, where people live. And a woman who lived there came out right away and, and talked to us. She, she offered us water. She was upset. She said, this happens all the time. Uh, I called 911 to let them know that, that we you know, had this sort of event that had happened, things that were stolen. They wanted to know if you know, any passports or social security cards had been stolen. And since that wasn't the case, they just told me, they directed me to, to dial 311. And then I just had to file a police report online. So, so there I was sort of in the street with my phone, just kind of trying to <laughs> make sense of, of what happened. And I had to like type everything on my phone, right? So, you know, okay, we were, we were parked near the corner of Jefferson and Broderick. I, I don't even do a, a two thumb typing. I just like single, single <laughs> finger type. Parked near the corner of Jefferson and Broderick in San Francisco. We went to the visit the Fine Arts Palace and we returned to the vehicle and the passenger side window was smashed. Our four backpacks were stolen. It contained, you know, I had to like list all this stuff, my iPad and Annie's camera flash and expensive headphones and multiple chargers and cables for our phones and clothing and shoes and toiletries and medications. A purse was stolen with ID and cash and bank cards. I didn't know it at the time, but we were the victims of what's called a smash and grab. And, uh, we thought, you know, maybe we should look around. So Mara and I, we walked around the streets to see if any of our things had been discarded uh, in the bushes. We found nothing. It was really this sort of terrible feeling. We felt violated and dejected and angry. We were hurting. We'd had things taken from us. You know, some things couldn't be uh, replaced. Uh, Mara's songwriting journal uh, certainly couldn't be replaced. Other things could be replaced, but, but some things um, couldn't be. And, and there was just nothing we could do. But now we're sitting there on the street with this rental van with a smashed uh, window. And so we were still vulnerable. And so 
we had to figure out where was the closest rental location in San Francisco and we had to try and get there uh, in time before they closed and we kept calling but they didn't answer and we called and they didn't answer and I kept saying I don't think there's enough time for us to drive there we're not going to be able to get there in time before they close my wife Joy just kept saying just go just go right we'll just get there and you'll pound on the door and try and get it right so all right I don't know if you've been to San Francisco. I don't know if you've watched any of the, the scenes of San Francisco in a, a movie or in a TV show, but, but in this particular area of the city, going from the coast uh, of the bay inland, uh, it's just this big mountainous hill, right? It's the, it's the steep streets of San Francisco. And I've driven a lot of places, uh, but especially uh, in that moment, it was, it was a little scary. I mean, when you're driving, you just sort of feel like you're kind of going straight up. It's not, but it's quite an angle. You just kind of feel like you're going straight up when you're, when you're headed up and you're trying to look over this, the steering wheel and, and you got to kind of put the accelerator down to kind of get up there. And, and they thought that wasn't difficult enough. So they put stop signs at every single uh, intersection at every block. So, so you'd get up there and then you had to kind of keep on the accelerator and try and get to a stop and try and look over the, the steering wheel on the dash to see if anybody else was coming. And then you had to kind of keep going and and so, so you had to stop at every intersection and, and try and not roll backwards while you're waiting for your turn to go. But finally, after you get up each of these, you know, blocks and each of these intersections after going what felt like straight up, well, well, you know, right? What goes up must come down. <laughs> so, so then the streets went downward at this sort of precipitous angle. Again, you sort of felt like you were going straight down. It wasn't actually like that. But again, you had to slam on your brakes at every intersection to come to, to a stop. You know, they don't have that Iowa winter weather in San Francisco or they would die on these streets out there, right? So we went up and up and up and down and down and down. And then we tried kind of found our way through the city uh, following the, the map on our phone and, and we finally got to the rental place and it was actually a little bit past closing time but I was able to run up there and, and uh, the door was actually still open and, and tell them what had happened and they were, they were able to help us. They, they took in our van with the broken window and they gave us a sedan with a nice lockable trunk, right? And then at this point we just we had to get out of the city. We had to get to our place where we were staying. And we had this kind of bad taste in our mouth from San Francisco. And we navigated through the city once again. Oh, there's Chinatown, right? You know, we drove north on the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, out of San Francisco. And as soon as we got uh, on the other side, we stopped at a, a Target that we found so we could buy some chargers and cables so we could at least charge our phones that, you know, we still had a, with us. They'd been on our persons. And then finally, you know, we, we got to our, our rental, our little vacation rental we had there. And it was, it was really wonderful. It was this little place perched on the hillside that was overlooking the coastline of, of the Pacific Ocean. Again, it was really this sort of beautiful place. Um, but of course, we didn't feel so great at that point. But we got settled and, and we ate something and we were just kind of sitting there, you know, in the dumps, in the doldrums. And all of a sudden, uh, our daughter, Annie, she yelled, <gasps> someone found our bags right she said she got a facebook message from someone who they found some of some of our bags and so quickly I, I grabbed my phone right and i started looking at my phone and sure enough someone had sent me a facebook message as well saying the same thing uh, annie and i both happened to have some identification in our bags and so when they found it they started searching on online for us in fact when they started searching for me they they found the church that I was serving uh, at the time and uh, they called the uh, office and, and told them that they'd found the bags that had been stolen from us. And the next morning when staff arrived, they came in and they were really worried hearing, you know, that, that someone had found bags that were stolen from us. But we, we connected with these people uh, online and we were messaging and then we were texting and emailing with people who found our belongings and and they searched for us on the internet and, and contacted us. Now, actually, the first people who found our stuff, they left our bags on the street, but they called the police. But, but when we said, hey, can you go get our bags? They, they went back for, the, for our bags, but our bags were gone at that point. Of course, they figured the police had picked them up. But what really happened was another couple then found our bags and they decided uh, when they contacted us, uh, they, they took our belongings right into their garage to keep it safe. And, and so now they were, they were connecting with Annie and, and Annie asked them what they had and, 
and asked to describe everything they had found. And, and we, we learned that they found pretty much most everything, including Mara's bag that had her songwriting journal in it. And it was this massive sort of amount of relief and, and thankfulness of gratitude. You know, we were elated. We were just so relieved. And, and these kind people gave us their address so we could get to their house. And, and then after we had all of that sort of arranged, then we were finally able to sort of relax and, and enjoy uh, that night. The next day, then, of course, we did. We went back across the Golden Gate Bridge into the city, into uh, San Francisco, and, and drove right to their home. It was just a few blocks from where we had been parked uh, when we had uh, stopped and, and been broken into. And, and we met these wonderful people, Mike, Mike and Helen. And they took us into their home and into their garage and they showed us the bags that they had found and and we were able to recover almost all of our stuff. I mean, really, really about everything except for, well, my iPad, right? And and Annie's camera flash, which was an expensive camera flash and, and some cash and some expensive headphones and weirdly also the toiletries were missing. Um, So, you know, maybe they needed a shower. I don't know. We really got everything else back that had been stolen out of our vehicle. And then we learned that these smash and grabs happen just constantly in San Francisco. It's really quite an epidemic. 30,000 a year. Gangs from Oakland and and San Jose go to the tourist spots in San Francisco and search out vehicles that have things still inside of them. And then they just use the hard end of a of a uh, spark plug and they can just sort of jab the window, they can poke the window with that hard end and that window will just smash into a thousand pieces and then they can just literally dive into the vehicle and grab whatever they can as fast as they can, anything that might have um, cash or, or electronics and they're literally, they're out of the vehicle in five seconds, they jump in a getaway vehicle and they're gone. And uh, it's kind of a sad thing, these smash and grabs that are going on. but. Mike and Helen, these people we connected with, they've lived there in that neighborhood for more than 30 years. And um, even living there 30 years, they're the second newest people uh, in their neighborhood. They're good people, wonderful people. And they feel just kind of sick about this crime that happens there and, and, and about what happened to us. And we were so grateful. But here's an interesting thing. Mike said just a couple of times that he hoped someone would do the same thing for them that they were doing for us. And that really kind of, that really kind of touched me. He hoped that somebody would do the same thing for them that they were doing for us. And I got to tell you, it just made all the difference in the world to Joy and me and to Annie and Mara. I mean, these people, they, they just found these bags out on the street and they took the time to, to search for us online and to contact us and to try and help us It just made all the difference in the world. And I really think that that's what the Apostle Paul means when he says, bear one another's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. When people are going through difficult things, through through hard things, you help carry them. You walk with them. You hold them up. This This is the law of Christ. Now, there's some question about what the Apostle Paul means uh, regarding the law of Christ. But, but let me say this. Jesus, when he was asked for the most important commandment out of 613, and this was kind of a legitimate question. You know, Jesus, there's 613 laws, 613 commandments, right? So what's the most important of all of those? And Jesus said, first, love the Lord your God. And second, Love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, before he was killed and and raised in the resurrection, Jesus gave his followers a new commandment to love one another the way Jesus loves us. That's how people will know that we belong to Jesus. And a little bit earlier in this letter to Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote, Look, the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love God your neighbor is yourself. Showing God's love to others is the law of Christ. And that's what we do as people who follow Jesus. And so I think about 
Mike and Helen in San Francisco who helped, who helped us bear our burden about how Mike said he really hoped that, that somebody would do the same thing for them that, that they did for us. But, but it's not just Mike and Helen out there. There were others who helped bear our burden too. I mean, there was the neighbor woman uh, where we were parked um, who came out and, and offered us hospitality. She asked if, if we wanted some water or if we needed to even use her bathroom. Can you imagine that? I mean, complete strangers on the street and she offered us this warm and caring hospitality. But most important, she was, she was the first person to just sort of be present with us. We weren't alone. Someone was there with us. And, and I think you know how important that is, right? I mean, when you're going through a hard time, when you're going through a difficult time, it is so important to just have someone be there with you. They don't have to do anything. They, they don't have to like have all the answers. They just are there with you so you don't feel alone. There were the two women who worked at the car rental agency and, and they stayed late and they didn't grumble and they didn't complain. Um, it was after closing time, but they made sure that we were taken care of. There was Jen and Mark. They were actually the first people who contacted uh, us after finding our stuff. And, and then of course, Mike and Helen who, who grabbed our, our items so that they would be safe for us. You know, we were strangers but they offered us hospitality. They gave us their phone numbers and addresses and sort of helpful information. They didn't have to, right? They didn't have to get involved. They didn't have to grab those bags. They didn't have to do any of that. They didn't have to. They could have ignored us. They could have ignored the situation. They could have left, you know, the poor saps who had things stolen from them to fend for themselves, but they didn't. They willingly jumped in with us and bore our burden which was like loving us like Jesus. I didn't leave my heart in San Francisco. I left my iPad. (laughs) But we met some good people, some good people who follow the law of Christ, and it made all the difference in the world to us. Now, I know in sharing that story with you that you are also good people who willingly bear one another's burdens. And I know you do that for one another in in our church uh, and, and for those beyond our church and even for strangers because that is the the law of Christ, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And sometimes just that makes all the difference in the world. Thanks be to God.